Microsoft was the first software company where we wrote software for personal computers. And we believed that we could hire the best engineers. There was an unbelievable amount of software to be written. And we could do it well. And we could do it on a, a global basis. And uh, the original customer base was the hardware manufacturers. And we sold to literally hundreds and hundreds, you know, uh, over 100 companies in Japan, over 100 companies doing word processors and industrial control type things. We knew in the long run we wanted to sell software directly to users, but we actually didn't get around that until 1980 when we had uh, our first sort of games and uh, uh, productivity software that, that people would go to a computer store and actually buy the, the software package. Paul Allen and I had used that phrase even before we wrote the basic for Microsoft. We actually talked about it in an article in, I think, 1977 was the first time it appears in print, where we say a computer on, a, on every desk and in every home, and actually the, we said running Microsoft software. If we were just talking about the vision, we'd leave the, those last three words out, uh, if we were talking an internal company discussion, we'd put those words in. And it's very hard to recall how crazy and wild that was. You know, on every desk and in every home, you know, at the time you have people who are very smart saying, you know, why would somebody need a computer? Even Ken Olson who had run this company, Digital Equipment, who made the computer I grew up with, and you know that we admired both him and his company immensely, was saying that this seemed kind of a, a silly idea that people would want to have a computer. Microsoft did the software for all the personal computers that came out. There was uh, the Apple II that we did a, a basic for, which was called AppleSoft Basic. There was a Commodore PET that we did a basic for. There was a Radio Shack TRS-80 that we did a basic for. Uh, even Atari, who initially had their own mini basic, uh, ended up using our basic. So our basic was running on every single machine, including that uh, Apple machine, and we later did a uh, basic for the Macintosh. We, we didn't mind doing uh, low price contracts at the time because we always knew there'd be new versions and more software that we would do. And, you know, so it worked out well. You know, as part of that Apple deal, I got to know Steve Wozniak, which, who was actually an engineer and did software programming, and a bit Steve Jobs, who later I would do a lot of work with uh, because he was deeply involved in the, the Macintosh work. We had plenty of ways to, you know, do new versions and do add-ons and things. So, no, the, the whole structure of the way we licensed things was that we knew we could write software more efficiently than if they hired the engineers themselves. So we always was a, were able to say, hey, you would have spent a half million developing that yourself. You know, we'll license it to you for an uh, inexpensive price. We probably could have high, had prior, higher prices, but... You know, we were doing fine. You know, in fact, that 6502 basic uh, that uh, Mark Chamberlain and I wrote, we licensed to about 12 different people. And so, you know, our profitability was huge, even though it was a great deal for Apple. Uh, per machine, they paid almost nothing. And we had a deal with these Mitz Altair people to pay us a royalty for each copy that was sold. And so if people paid MITS, we got a royalty. And if they just copied the program, which was at the time on paper tape, we didn't get paid. And so there was a lot of this going on. And the amount of piracy was going to determine whether Microsoft could hire more people or not. And so I wrote, you know, what was, wasn't mean or 
I, you know, it, it was just, it was called an open letter to hobbyists that said, by the way, uh, you know, this is copyrighted material and the more we sell, the more software we'll be able to write. And that started a debate that rages to this day, it'll rage for decades to come, of should creative people who do music or books or software be able to get a royalty for their stuff or should, uh, you know, people pirate it. And, you know, there's a lot of complicated issues in, in intellectual property, but it, it, it started early in the computer industry. And, and a lot of people did uh, actually respond to the letter by uh, coming back and paying the license fee, which was very low. I mean, we, uh, everything was very, very cheap. Okay, I've been talking about our basic and running that on a computer. There's two ways you could run basic. You can run it where the basic is right on the hardware and the only thing you're running is basic. Or you can put another layer of software in between called an operating system and it can take over some of the work like managing the printers and, and things. And you can have many programs, basic or a spreadsheet or a word processor running on top of that. And as we got disks on these computers, it made more sense to have that flexibility. The early computers don't have disks. <laughs> they have cassette tapes and paper tapes and things like that. But uh, by 79, 80, we're starting to get these big, expensive, actually initially eight inch floppy disks. You know, then five and a quarter inch, finally three and a half inch. Now, you know, when's the last time you saw a floppy disk? But they were very, important. We still have a hard disk, the disk built into the computer. So you needed an operating system. And so when IBM saw that we had written the software for all the personal computers, they came to us, sought our advice on the design, but we said you should put a disk in. And since they wanted to ship very quickly, another company um, called Digital Research had done that work uh, for the 8-bit machines and they were starting to do a version for this, these new 16-bit machines. We convinced IBM to do a 16-bit machine using this 8086, 8088 processor. Well, digital research really hadn't finished the work. And then IBM was getting frustrated because digital research wouldn't sign even the non-disclosure agreement. And then some of us, uh, particularly Paul and a uh, uh, key person named Kazuhiko Nishi, uh, who was from Japan and worked with us, said, no, 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 we should just do that ourselves. And because of the quick timing, we ended up licensing the original code from another company uh, and turned that into MS-DOS. And so then, subsequently, MS-DOS competed with this digital research CPM. Uh, after about two or three years, MS-DOS became far, far more popular uh, than than CPM, and then eventually we would take and add graphics capability on top of MS-DOS, and then integrate the two together. And so today when we talk about Windows, it actually includes all those MS-DOS things in it. That's the full operating system, although mostly you think of the graphics and the Windows and stuff. There's a lot of more classic operating system capability that, that's built in there. The IBM initial deal is a flat fee deal, uh, another flat fee deal. It had certain restrictions that prevented IBM from selling to other hardware makers. So if people did IBM PC compatible machines, we would get the revenue by doing business directly with those people. And the, the deal was very complicated, but it was a deal that Steve Ballmer, who's a key person at the company by that time, and I thought a lot about and it was a fairly junior team from IBM, and so we tried to make sure that given our belief that personal computers would be hyper popular, that Microsoft would get a lot of that upside. So they felt they got a very good deal, which they did, but as the industry expanded, we, um, for new versions and for different machines, we got that opportunity, even though they did not pay us a royalty. 
even in the early days, if you set a computer on every desk in every home and you'd say, okay, how many homes are there in the world? How many desks are there in the world? You know, can I make 20 bucks for every home, 20 bucks for every desk? You know, you could get these big numbers. But part of the beauty of the whole thing was we were very focused on the here and now. Should we hire one more person? If our customers didn't pay us, would we have enough cash to meet the payroll? You know, we really were very practical about that next thing and so involved in the deep engineering that we didn't get ahead of ourselves. We never thought, you know, how big we'd be. I remember when uh, one of the early lists of wealthy people came out and uh, one of the Intel founders was there. The guy who ran Wing Computers actually was still, Wang was still doing well. And we thought, hmm, boy, if the software business does well, the value of Microsoft could be similar to that. But it wasn't a real focus. The, the everyday activity of just doing great software drew us in. And some decisions we made, like the quality of the people, the way we were very global, the vision of uh, how we thought about software, that was very long term. But you know, other than those things, you know, we just came into work every day and uh, wrote more code and you know, hired, hired more people. And it wasn't really until the IBM PC succeeded, and perhaps even until Windows succeeded, that there was a broad awareness that Microsoft was very unique as a software company, that these other companies had been one product companies, hadn't hired people, couldn't do a broad set of things, didn't renew their excellence, didn't do research. Um, so you know, we thought we were doing something very unique, but it was easily uh, not until 1995 or even 1997 that, that there was this wide recognition that we, we were the company that had, had revolutionized software. When I was very young, I hadn't been exposed to computers, so I was mostly just reading, uh, doing math, learning about science, and I wasn't sure what my career would be. I knew I loved uh, learning about things. I was an avid reader, uh, but it was when I was 12 years old that I, I first got to use a computer, actually a very limited machine by uh, today's standards. Uh, that, but that definitely fascinated me when I was first exposed. Well, I, I was intrigued uh, by figuring out what it could do and what it couldn't do, and some friends and I spent lots of time. Uh, the teachers got intimidated, so we were on our own trying to figure it out. Actually, we gave a course on computers uh, to the other students. And it became you know, a fascination where uh, we got paid for doing computer work and talked about forming a, a company. Uh, but there was kind of a magical breakthrough when the computer became uh, cheap and we could see that everyone could afford a computer. Uh, that was much later, uh, but it, uh, that's what got us to really get together and, and create a company for software. I read a lot. Uh, there were always contests at the library in the summer where, you know, if you read 10 books, you got a little gold star. If you read 20, you got like two. And, uh, there were like five or six girls and I that would always read like 35 books and we'd see, you know, who could do the most. Um, it was a broad set of things. Uh, eventually, a fair bit of science fiction uh, because that intrigued me. Uh, some biographies, you know, understanding what different leaders had done and how they'd picked what they'd wanted to do. And... So I'd say science fiction and biography were the, the categories that had the most impact. Yeah, the, in, among the science fiction uh, things, uh, uh, Williams Rice Burroughs wrote a Martian series, and I read that. Then he also had the Tarzan books, and there's an unbelievable number of them, uh, like 40 of them, and I eventually decided to read those as well. I didn't actually read Catcher in the Rye until I was 13, and you know, ever since then, I've said that's my, my favorite book. It's you know, very clever, 
you know, it acknowledges that young people are a little confused, but it can be smart about things and see things that adults don't really see. Uh, so I've, I've always loved it. My second uh, favorite book is, is the book by John Knowles called The Separate Piece. And that's a phenomenal uh, book. I've uh, been reading it to my uh, son recently. Uh, there's actually a movie made of it that's fairly good, but you know, I'd say the book uh, is, is incredibly good. That's two young boys growing up, one who is, is sort of intentionally trying to be good at things, and the other, Eugene, is just kind of naturally uh, great at sports and has this wonderful energy, and uh, they have this great friendship, and it happens to be at a time where the older boys are going off to war and they're trying to figure out what does that mean to them. And the author talks about this period of his life as really defining how he, the rest of his life, how he sees everything as sort of in comparison to this period where he didn't really know where he fit in. You know, he thought of himself as maybe too calculating. And uh, the end of the book, which I won't spoil, uh, is a bit of a tragedy with this friend of his, uh, but it, it really uh, talks a lot about what is our bargain with the world, how do we grow up, uh, what are we uh, worried about, and, and how do we uh, take that into adulthood. Through eighth grade, um, I was sort of enjoying the fact that I could do reasonably well without any effort. Uh, they had this thing where you'd you'd get an effort, which would be one, two, or three, and then a grade. And so the I ideal I always wanted was an A3, where you had the least effort but the highest uh, grade. So my grades weren't all that great. And then in eighth grade, I uh, had been at a private school for a couple of years and decided that I better start getting good grades, both in terms of having some freedom, the way I'd be treated in, thinking about college. So uh, from ninth grade on, I had a, a reasonably spotless uh, grade record. Um, so that I, I got quite serious about grades at that point. Uh, math was the thing that uh, came most natural to me. And you know, you'd take these exams, uh, some of which were sort of nationwide exams, and uh, I did quite well on those. And that, that gave me some confidence. And I had some teachers who were very encouraging. Uh, they let me read textbooks. They encouraged me to take a uh, college course on uh, symbolic math, which is actually called algebra. Uh, so I, I felt pretty confident in my math skills, which is a nice thing because uh, not only the sciences, but economics, a lot of things, if you're comfortable uh, with math and statistics and uh, ways of, of looking at cause and effect. Uh, that's extremely helpful. I had a, a one named Paul Stockland who, uh, at the, the school I was at, who challenged me. Uh, later, one named uh, Fred Wright who challenged me. Um, then, you know, I, I actually majored in math uh, for uh, the time I was at uh, at college, uh, because you know it was a very interesting topic, but it was kind of a strange topic because there's not a direct career for most people in terms of being a full-time mathematician. So, for all but very few people, it's a tool that you use, but not probably not what you're going to spend your life working on. My parents had this notion that. I had this high potential somehow and that I was not taking advantage of it. Uh, that, you know, the in environment I'd been in, sort of being a goof off was more socially rewarding than being that serious. And it was public school, you know, so they weren't pushing people all that hard. You could read the textbook in the first week and, you know, sort of there was, wasn't anything interesting going to happen the rest of the the school year. And so they had me take an exam to go to a private school. And I thought, well, should I pass this exam or not? You know, you could fail it and they wouldn't, you wouldn't have to go. 
Uh, but that, that sort of violated my sense of integrity that, you know, hey, I'm good at taking tests. I don't want to uh, get confused about that. So I, I was admitted, and they encouraged me to go. It was a boys' school, reasonably strict. Uh, during the time I was there, it actually transitioned, uh, merged with a girls' school and stopped having uniforms, stopped calling the teachers master. Uh, so it, it became pretty normal. But it was, a, it was a change at first. And the idea of just being kind of a goof off wasn't the sort of high reward uh, position like it'd been in, in public school. So that, it, you know, my parents were right. It, it had the intended effect of, of creating a more challenging environment. And you know, some teachers who uh, were nice about saying that, you know, I should try harder and uh, exposing me to a lot of math and science. Um, and eventually, uh, that's where I, I got to, to use the computer. Lakeside was a longer school day, and it, you know, it's a change. I had gotten super comfortable at public school, uh, kind of being goofy, and you know, here people were studying, and at first, because I, I didn't get great gr grades, they had me in a study hall, and a few people who got really good grades didn't have to go to the study hall, uh, and nobody knew, you know, that I was actually clever, so, uh, you know, they were actually treating me like some average student. Anyway, it was, it was an adjustment, and all the other kids there were uh, making the adjustment as well, so it took a couple of years to get my grounding. You know, I'm, I'm super glad that I, I went to that school. It, uh, it was a fantastic school. I'll probably send my, my kids to that school. The Lakeside's Mother's Club, uh, had a rummage sale every year to raise money for the school. And instead of just funding the budget, they always would fund something kind of new and interesting in addition. And without too much understanding, they decided having a computer terminal at the school would be a novel thing. It was a, a teletype, uh, uppercase only, you know, 10 characters a second. Uh, and you had to share a phone line to call in to a big computer, a time-sharing computer that was very expensive. It charged uh, when you were connected up, it would charge, and then when you actually had a program running, it would charge a lot more. And so they set up this teletype, and some of the math and science teachers you know, played around with it. One of them accidentally spent a lot of money uh, with the infinite loop program. They spent like $200 by surprise. And so they were a bit intimidated and a bunch of us kind of hung out there and tried out different things. Uh, the programming language was basic, uh, which was quite novel at the time. It had been invented by some Dartmouth professors. And so that was the first computer language I learned. And I wrote, I wrote increasingly complex programs and so that eighth grade exposure was, was a pretty neat thing, even though what the machine we were working on was, was quite limited. The idea of students playing around with a computer was very unusual at the time. And in fact, that computer, um, you know, eventually the costs were high enough, they, they took it away, but then uh, some other computer companies had come around, including one in Seattle, that uh, a bunch of us went down and volunteered to help out and do some work for us. So we, from that point on, we always managed, although it was dicey at times, to find access to computers. And that was very unusual uh, in high school. But it took a lot of initiative on our part to get those experiences. But we wouldn't have done it if we hadn't had that that early eighth grade exposure. The key point is that computers were immensely expensive uh, and cost millions of dollars. A machine that was far less powerful than, than what you have in a, a cell phone today. And so that either you'd have a very important application or you just shared the machine with other people and still you had to pay quite a bit of money. 
And so time sharing is where you're connected up and, and sharing the machine. It's a lot better than sending your programs in because you can see when you make a mistake uh, pretty quickly. Even so, because they charge us so much, we'd actually type the programs offline on a paper tape uh, so that we didn't have any delay for typing. And then when we got onto the computer, we'd feed in that tape uh, so that there was less, less time online. But it, it gave you a sense of, OK, what you got right and wrong, and you could try and correct things. Uh, we also, because at that time, the dominant form of computing was using punch cards. We actually did that quite a bit. We were down at the University of Washington and used some of those punch card systems. As computers became less expensive, so-called mini computers, then more people had access, mostly scientists and business people. But also, we managed to find machines that weren't being used at night. The idea of a machine is something that an individual would use and that it would just sit there idle when they weren't using it. That only made sense about a decade later when the work that we and others had done had gotten the, the price down so dramatically that the idea of a computer sitting idle you know, doesn't feel like some huge waste of resources uh, like uh, it did when they were so uh, expensive and rare. Programming is where you're describing to the machine how to do something. And so telling it how to play tic-tac-toe, telling it how to play the game, board game Monopoly, telling it uh, how to convert numbers from one base to another. And the idea of, OK, there's these simple instructions, but if you put them together, then you can synthesize something quite complex. Uh, it's a fascinating kind of mathematical thing. How can you make it fast? How can you make it small? And I went through several phases of doing more complex programs where people who were great programmers would look at my work, give me feedback on it. And you know, you get so you you're you can be a, quite a good programmer. And it was kind of a such a, a intense activity between the age of 13 and 17. Uh, that you know, we learned a lot. Uh, eventually, one of the programs we took on was the idea of the scheduling of, of our school. When should the classes meet? Who should be in which section? So you have all these requests for people who want different classes and keeping them small and not having the teachers teach too many classes in a row. Very complex kind of software problem. And actually, when the school first asked me to do it, uh, when I was 15, I said that I, I didn't know how. And they asked some adults to do it, and that didn't work. Uh, and then about a year later, I'd figured out how to do it. And so my friends and I actually did the software that did all this high school scheduling. Um, it had some fantastic uh, benefits to us. And we got paid for doing it. It was exactly the kind of com complex problem that uh, developed my skills very well. And you know we got some degree of control over who was in our classes. And uh, so you know it, it combined the best of everything. Initially, when that teletype showed up, there were probably 20 kids who sort of showed an interest. And it was confusing enough that it got winnowed down to about uh, eight or nine fairly quickly who were quite serious about it. And then uh, there were about four of us who were hyper serious, you know, kind of doing it day and night. And uh, two of them were two years older than I was, and one uh, was my same age. Now, in a high school, people are two years ahead of you. You know, they don't socialize with the young kids all that much. Uh, so the idea that we had this group of four of us, you know, it's kind of unusual. We called it the Lakeside Programming Group. And one of the companies we'd been doing work for went bankrupt, the one in Seattle. And so we went to one in Portland, Oregon, Computer Center Corporation, C-Cubed, uh, which had been in the University District in Seattle. And we'd spent a lot of time there. And they were wonderful to us. They weren't a well-run business, so they went bankrupt. So this company uh, down in Portland, Oregon, 
said, hey, we're not just going to give you computer time. You have to do something. So we agreed to write this payroll program. And a payroll program is surprisingly complicated. There's all these taxes and reports and things uh, at the state level and federal level. Anyway, uh, they said, well, if you could write one of those, we'd at least give you free computer time. And so I negotiated that deal. And the two older members, uh, Paul Allen and Rick, said, well, you know, this is, there's not enough work to go around, so we're going to take charge of this. And I said, okay, you know, I'm not that interested because I had in mind how I wanted to do the payroll program. And so they, they messed around for about three months, didn't get much done, uh, and then said, well, you, you join back up. And I said, okay, but, you know, if so, I'm in charge uh, of this. And, you know, it's going to kind of set a precedent for future activities. But they said, no, no, that's fine. And so we worked. We actually finished this payroll program. It was a lot of work. Uh, the friend who was my age, uh, Kent Evans, and I ended up doing the lion's share of the work. Now, tragically, right as he and I finished that, he was killed in a, a mountain climbing accident. And um, so then there were, there were just three of us left who'd been extremely involved, including Paul Allen, uh, who was the one who was reading the magazines even more than I was. And he was the one who actually saw this computer on a chip, so-called microprocessor, uh, in a very small, obscure article, but he saw that it would be deeply important and, and brought that to me uh, in 1971. So we were still 15, I was 15, and he was 17 um, at the time. So these CQ people have this computer, which is a time-sharing computer, and they're letting us come in at night. And they had this deal with the company who made the computer, Digital Equipment, corporation, that they had this acceptance period. If they could find problems with it, they could delay their rental payments. And so they thought of us as kind of monkeys that might find some problems and help them delay their rental payments. Well, that, that was a fair analysis because at first we were just completely goofing around. Like we'd have try to run hundreds of jobs at the same time or have all the jobs try and grab the same resources to see if we could get the system to fail. And we did in kind of this brute force approach. And so that would, they would report that as a problem and delay their rental payment. Well, as a few months went by, actually about four months by the end of it, we had gotten very uh, uh, sophisticated. In fact, we'd gotten the source code of the operating system out of the garbage can and were reading it. And the kind of problems we were finding were far more subtle. In fact, we'd not only find the problem, we'd look and we'd suggest how they might fix it. Well, anyway, digital equipment got so tired of this, they said, look, you got to pay. You're going to be able to find problems, these, these kinds of problems forever, but we need to get paid. And so then there was a question whether they would let us stay there or not. And it was pretty tenuous. Um, and so Paul and I, you know, we understood the system well enough that we could look at all the passwords of the various uh, accounts. And so, you know, we could use literally any account. And um, then people, when they found out we'd done that, they got kind of mad about that. They weren't sure how mad they should be about it because we hadn't really caused any damage. But, you know, it wasn't a, a good thing. You know, computer hacking was literally just being invented uh, at the time. And so fortunately, we got off with a bit of a warning. But there actually was a period that because of that, they said we weren't supposed to use the computer. And it was over a summer. And Paul actually went up to the University of Washington and found ways to use the computer uh, and get connected up. Uh, and he, he took a while before he told me. And then eventually, he told me about that. And we got, we got back on. I was really quite serious about math at the time and various science things. Uh, Paul had actually read more science fiction than I had by, I mean, by a lot. Uh, and so he and I 
would talk about that. But I had plenty of things. It was not, wasn't some great tragedy. But then we got, you know, pulled back in. Then that company went bankrupt. And then we had the uh, work for this uh, Portland company on the payroll program. And then we had the, the scheduling program. And so, you know, we were lucky. There were always kind of things that not only gave us an opportunity, but exposed us uh, to that next level. You know, after the payroll program, then there was a, a computer project to use computers to control all the electricity grid in the dams of the Pacific Northwest. It's a government agency called Bonneville Power had uh, done a contract with a company called TRW to use computers to do all this control. And TRW had committed to do all this really high reliability, great software work. Well, they found it more difficult than they expected. And so they um, were looking for people who understood uh, the, these kinds of computers, which Paul and I, Paul Allen and I, had done a lot of work on. This was the same computer that was at Computer Center Corporation and at this Portland company, Information Sciences. Anyway, so they, they, we were kind of famous, but nobody had met us because we'd filed these problem reports. And by the end of these problem reports, we, they were so sophisticated, it was like, who are these guys? You know, out in Seattle telling us how to fix all this stuff. And so when TRW is saying, hey, we're desperate, find us, uh, they're telling digital equipment who makes these things, find us the best programmers. And somebody says, well, there's Gates and Allen. And somebody says, well, nobody's really met them. But yeah, but they're really good. We, you know, we ought to be able to track them down. So they <laughs> find us, <laughs> this one guy, and we go for an interview. And they, you know, these two kids show up. And what was I when I was interviewed? I was 16 uh, when they interviewed me. So they're like, well, <laughs> we can't hire you. But you know, then they talk to us about software, and we clearly know a lot. And when you're young and you know a lot, people don't have any kind of intermediate thing. You're either, you know, what you're supposed to be, which is a kid who doesn't know that much, or they think, whoa, what, you know, this guy's the limit. Well, we were pretty good programmers. But anyway, so we got jobs at this TRW, and that exposed me to some programmers who were way better than I was, who critiqued my work. I could look at their work. You know, this one guy, uh, was really a phenomenal programmer, and he would just take my stuff and rip it apart, uh, in, you know, in this super constructive way. Anyway, it was it was a brilliant thing, and and so part of my senior year, uh, and the summer before and after the senior year, uh, Paul and I were down in uh, Vancouver, Washington, uh, working on this project. So it kind of took our understanding to a whole new level, and it exposed us to a bunch of uh, people there. And, you know, Paul the whole time, ever since he'd seen that Microprose article, was saying, you know, there's an opportunity here. This is going to be big. You know, we ought to think what we're going to do about this. So we kept, kept talking about that. In 1971, there's this obscure article on the microprocessor that Intel has done, the, the, what was called the 4004, that Paul said, look, this thing's going to keep getting better and it's going to be better than these mini computers. Mini computers were like ten thousand dollars to two hundred thousand, and Paul and I had uh, borrowed some of those and messed around with those. And Paul said, "No, no, you're going to have something better than the mini computer that costs uh, like a thousand dollars." So we kept watching those chips get better, and we did the scheduling program. Then my senior year, we're down at at TRW. They're getting better, and in fact, in 1973. Um, the 8080 chip comes out, and Paul, you know, shows that to me, and I say, okay, this is better than most of these mini computers, and so we think, wow, somebody's going to take that chip and do something well. Well, in the meantime, I start at Harvard University back in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, Paul's saying, hey, this, he's at Washington State, another place, so I help him get a job out uh, there in the Boston area. And we're just brainstorming, uh, you know, what's going to happen with the microprocessor. And I'm, you know, playing poker, uh, signing up for lots and lots of classes, undergraduate classes, graduate classes. Uh, but then, um, finally, 
somebody takes the 8080 chip and creates a kit computer, and that's on the cover of the January 1975 uh, Popular Electronics that comes out in December 1974. And so we get that, and that's both exciting because finally this thing that we've expected has happened, but the question is, is it happening without us? And so this company, which is in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we call them up and say, hey, we can do software for this machine. And they say, oh yeah, sure. Um, so we very quickly uh, work on a basic for this computer, which I'm well equipped to do. And Paul has is, is, had some brilliant ideas about how we'd simulate this machine because we didn't have one. And that was, was amazing. Um, so we write this thing and we call them up and we say, hey, when you connect a teletype up, how do you get the, what's the software programming to get the characters in and get them to print them? How do you do that? The so-called input-output. And they thought, well, that's interesting. You guys may not be flaky uh, because you're actually, you're the first one who asked that question, which is if you're gonna really write the software, you eventually have to ask that question. So they give us the answer and Paul flies out with this uh, paper tape of the software. So I'm a student at Harvard. Uh, Paul's working at Honeywell. Uh, and, but it, we spend, what was it, six weeks and really write this thing, which, you know, my whole career has sort of been building up <laughs> to this thing. It's a, one of the most, probably the most fun piece of software I ever wrote. I mean, it's unbelievable because it has to be very small. There's only 4K bytes of memory. And we don't have the real machine. So you have to be very careful to get everything right. Anyway, so Paul takes it out. And these guys mostly sell kit computers. They'd only assembled a few of them. And so they got it connected up. And, the, and Paul puts it in, and it runs the first time. So when you turn a computer on, there's nothing in it. It doesn't even know how to go out to the teletype and read this paper tape that has all these funny numbers on it that are this program. So you have to have... You have to put in, using the switches, a little program that's the program called the bootstrap loader that is the instructions to say, hey, go read a bunch of numbers off of this paper tape, put those into the memory, and then go run that program. So he wrote a bootstrap loader literally on the plane flying there. Uh, he wrote a nice bootstrap loader. It worked just fine. Later, I wrote a really, really small one. Because uh, you, it's a pain to have to every time the computer's turned back on, you have to re-enter to the thing. So the less of these funny little instructions, the better. Anyway, so he wrote that, and uh, everybody was amazed because we had to do everything totally right how we read this in, instruction set manual, and they they were selling these kit computers, but they'd never really seen it do anything real. And so you know, Paul would type in, you know, print. 2 plus 2 print, and he, he ran programs, and it worked. The chip itself um, was fairly expensive. Paul and I had bought a previous chip uh, to do a, a very specialized machine. We'd bought an 8008 to do uh, a little funny program that did traffic volume printouts. But this 8080 was much better, and we'd never had one of those. So we just read the book that described how it worked, and then we made the big computer uh, that we'd been using all those years uh, and were quite expert in. Uh, Paul had a really breakthrough idea of how to do this simulation thing. And so that gave us the full power of that computer to edit and debug and those things. But if we'd made any mistake in uh, how we read this thing, you know, that paper tape wasn't going to work at all. Anyway, so that was very exciting, and we signed a deal with them. Uh, that was called MITS, and their computer was called the Altair. And then I left Harvard University, and we started Microsoft. And so Microsoft was initially based uh, down in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is um, uh, 1973. When we, when we get going. In 
you know, we had been talking about that actually back at Harvard. And, you know, microcomputer software, you know, nobody else had done a co company doing software for these things. And we thought it was a cool term, Microsoft. When we had been kids and sending our names in for mailing lists, we'd played around with a lot of company names, including like Allen and Gates or things like that. But we decided, no, it'd be better not to have our names in it, because it wasn't like a law firm that was always kind of a small thing. You know, we thought, hey, we're going to have a big company, so we'll have this, you know, a company name. And so Microsoft was a, a very natural choice. Well, Microsoft was only a few people, and, and we'd written this basic. And the idea was to license it to lots of companies and then to write other software. And so the head of MITS said he could help us market it to other people and take a sales commission for that. And I wrote the contract so that if they weren't serious about promoting it and putting a lot of investment into that, uh, they would lose that right. And that was the best efforts clause, a very strong uh, requirement. And they never got serious about that. And yet, they kind of liked the idea of them having the basic and other people not. And uh, so we were discussing that, how we were going to resolve this problem, because we needed to license it to other people. And we were doing all the work to license it to other people, even though they were getting this commission. And right at that time, another company, Pertech, bought MITS. And then those people got confused about the contract. And so the, they weren't even paying us the money they owed us. Uh, they were essentially trying to starve us. And so we terminated the contract. And it had an arbitration clause. It was arbitrated that you know, the arbitrator found that we were right uh, out of five out of five reasons to terminate the contract. We were only right about five of them. Uh, and so the, that contract was terminated. And then we had to, like we ended up having to do, uh, built our, our sales and marketing activities. And by then, we started to have some other programs as well. So we started to hire more people, and things really got going. The big thing, though, was that because Pertech moved that company out to California, we no longer had a reason to be in Albuquerque, because you couldn't recruit as people there as uh, easily as you could to other locations. And so we talked about where to move, and eventually in uh, 1979, we move up to Seattle. My parents had been fantastic throughout my whole student career. I mean, getting me to go to Lakeside, uh, that my senior year at Lakeside where I'd wanted to take time off and do this job at TRW. They'd been very supportive of that, letting me live down in Vancouver, Washington. I, I challenged them a little bit when some of the, the my coworkers at TRW said I should skip undergraduate and just go to graduate school. And they were not enthused about that. It looked like I would have an opportunity to do that, but I didn't. I, I just went to Harvard. And that was another case where they were right, that you know, socially being with other undergraduates was good. I got to take graduate courses up at MIT, and I did that to a limited degree. So I, I kind of had the best of both worlds. Anyway, when it came time to uh, go on leave from Harvard, the policies of the school about if you're gone, letting you come back are incredibly generous. And so if the enterprise had failed, then you know, I would have been back. And so my parents were a little surprised and kind of wondering what it meant. Uh, but they were pretty supportive. And in fact, when we got into this legal dispute uh, with Pertech, you know, my dad gave me good advice. He was uh, very supportive on, on that. And so we saw that through. And you know, then as the company became successful, they, you know, I hope they felt better about it. You know, the only really bad case was if, if I stayed and the company was kind of mediocrely successful. If it failed, it would be OK. If it was a big success, it would be OK. And they, you know, they could see I was very energized. And I thought you know, we needed to get in at the very beginning and not waste a year or two, which is what I had left of my uh, undergraduate 
course requirements. College is amazing. There's all these smart kids sitting around. You can talk about anything. You know, there's courses you can go to. Uh, there's tests to see if you know what you're talking about. You know, there's nothing better than uh, a great college for your experience. And I would have stayed to the end if it hadn't been uh, for the, the urgency. You know, I watch lots of, of college lectures uh, online now because, you know, I, I enjoyed that so much. So, you know, unless you have something that's really uniquely, amazingly time dependent, uh, you know, it's a great thing to, to finish the degree. Well, I don't think it would have been a dramatic setback. You, you know, we would have figured out what mistake we'd made and, you know, eventually gotten the thing running. It turns out, even though we were in this big rush, there weren't many other people doing serious work at the time. It was another couple of years before other software companies showed up. And even then, they weren't that serious about hiring people. They didn't have people who really understood about writing software and how you created a, a company around writing software. They didn't figure out the global nature of the market. So we, we would have been fine, but it, it was certainly exciting that there was, there was no mistake at all. Microsoft was at the center of the personal computer revolution, in particularly, in particular the creation of a software market where you went out to lots of companies and encouraged them to write software for different applications, mundane applications, wild applications. That idea that, that you would encourage people to be creative and build software, and there'd be a whole industry around that. Uh, Microsoft believed in that, and no one else did. And so we got that going. And that's led now to where you have all these great choices and it just keeps getting better and better. And it's because of the volume of machines out there, it can be sold very, very inexpensively. So that whole bootstrap, getting the industry going, uh, making it, it personal, making there be lots of software, that's what we are the most proud of. I think the American dream is this kind of a global dream now that young people can come up with new ideas and, and create companies that make a contribution, uh, not just jobs, but whatever their innovations that they bring about. You know, capitalism is this unbelievable open system that if you combine it with uh, good infrastructure, good education, the creativity that we find uh, for people who've had that, those chances is always going to surprise us. It's always going to come up with new seeds, new medicines, new software, new movies, you know, things that are, are make the world a better place. The foundation got started um, in the late 90s with my dad encouraging me, uh, an executive named Patty Stone Cipher, who uh, left Microsoft, were helping out. I was still very busy. Our kids were uh, very young, uh, but we got going. We put computers in libraries in many different countries, including the United States. We did some scholarship things. We were learning about um, reproductive health and, and population issues, and that kept growing. And we met people who knew about vaccines. and uh, So it was a part-time thing. Uh, global health was a bit over half. Uh, the U U.S. focused uh, library scholarship education work was over a quarter. Uh, and the, it was a final piece uh, that relates to other things to help the poorest other than just uh, health uh, things, things like finance and savings. And it, you know, it grew. And then I saw that uh, I could make a unique contribution there and created a transition plan uh, that was four years in the making. And so now I'm full-time at the foundation and uh, playing a role of being the chairman and traveling a lot. Uh, so it's, you know, it's equally challenging. It's very fulfilling. It's taking this, these resources that I'm lucky enough to have because of the success of Microsoft and giving those back to the society 
in a way that can have the biggest impact. We need new vaccines, we need cheap vaccines, we need vaccines that are easy to deliver even in these the poorest places where something like having refrigerators is, is tough to do. And it does connect to my experience at Microsoft of finding great scientists, making sure they understand the problems that are important, getting them focused on those things, having milestones, uh, even if they're setbacks, you know, making sure if this possibility is still there that they get the, the proper backing. This is something that governments don't do much of. They, they fund a lot of the great delivery. Uh, the foreign aid is, is very, very important. But on the discovery side, there's been a deep underinvestment, whether it's a malaria vaccine, tuberculosis vaccine, about 20 different diseases that, if things go well, will have vaccines for most of those within the next decade. And so the foundation has really taken the lead financing those, that scientific work and you know, already some have been discovered, some are getting out there, but there's a lot more still to be done.